Welcome to the Progress Report Training for the Consolidated Grant Program to address children and youth experiencing domestic and sexual assault and engage men and boys as allies. This is a rather long title, so I refer to this program throughout the training as CY. This particular training is for CY comprehensive grantees that are using the Children and Youth Exposed to Violence Progress Reporting Form. If you look on the right-hand side of the screen, this is the progress reporting form that you're using and that we will go over today. Before we begin, it's important to note that the CED form was created prior to the CY program, so the form is not an exact fit for what you are being asked to report. However, with some tweaks, the CED reporting form is applicable to the activities of the CY program. Here at Muskie, we have developed special instructions that we will go through today to help you report as accurately as possible. No special instructions will be needed for sections A through C on the reporting form. Sections D and E are the two sections that you will need to use the special instructions when filling out the form. We'll discuss those in more detail when we get to those sections. Additionally, please note that the terms children or child you will see throughout the reporting form also refer to youth and young adults. There are two reporting periods that go with this form and your grant. The first is January to June, and the report that is due for that period is due 30 days after the close of the reporting period, so it is due on July 30th. The other reporting period is July to December, and again, that report is due 30 days after the close of the reporting period, which is January 30th. Before we begin looking at the form, I first want to spend a little time talking about the importance of accurate reporting. First and foremost, thank you for accessing our reporting. We hope this training enables you to provide the most detailed and accurate reporting of your grant-funded work on your semi-annual progress report. Accurate data reporting is important for many reasons. Your quantitative and qualitative data enables VAWA's effectiveness to be measured. VAWA MEI creates reports for OVW using your data and the data from grantees across the country. These summary data reports support OVW to make requests for increased appropriations and to defend VAWA's funding to decision makers. Your data also helps OVW to make sure federal funds are being spent appropriately and to measure the performance of grant programs. Additionally, every two years, the Attorney General is required to submit a report to Congress on the overall effectiveness of VAWA funding. VAWA grantee data makes up a significant part of that mandated report. The more consistently grantees fill out their reports, the more accurately VAWA's effectiveness can be measured through these means. Next, we're going to talk about a few tips for successful data reporting. The first is to read the separate instructions there is a set of instructions you can find on our website that pairs with each question of the form and gives you guidance as well as examples. Additionally, we ask that you read the special instructions that we mentioned earlier. Because the form is not an exact fit for your grant activities, these special instructions will help you to best report all the activities and the victims that you're serving. Use the other category only if no close fit exists. We ask that you use the other category only if you can't find a way to put the information into a category that already exists, because when we aggregate data for reports, often the responses in the other category do not get included. However, we know there are some cases where the other category is really the only accurate option for what you're trying to report. That is completely fine. We just ask that you take the time to rule out all other options first. Another tip, use optional information questions to discuss successes and or provide more detail. Following most sections of the form, you'll find these optional narrative questions. You can use these questions to talk about the unique successes of your grant-funded activities or further explain the data that you have included in that section of the report. Oftentimes, the hard data does not capture the full story on its own. Therefore, we encourage you to report in the optional narrative question to help us, as well as your program specialists, most 
accurately understand the work you're doing with grant funds. We ask that you try not to use acronyms or abbreviations in your data. If you do use an acronym, please provide an explanation in each question where you use the acronym. Therefore, we will understand what you're talking about and not have to guess. Sometimes we do Google acronyms we see, but unfortunately it is not always accurate. Another tip is to not include attachments or extra documents as a way to report data. Any attachment or extra document you include with your report in the GMS system is something that we're not going to see. When we get the data from OBW, we only get what has been included in the progress report. Therefore, if there's something that you want Muskie to see, please include it in your report, in particular in the narrative questions. Finally, if you have any questions about reporting, please give us a call or send us an email. We're here to help and we're happy to help. So please consider giving us a call. We can talk through your staff FTEs or maybe you have a question about how to report a training. Or we also will provide our email information at the end and you can shoot us an email and we can answer your questions there or set up a time to speak. Section A1, Grant Information. All grantees must complete this subsection. For question one, you're going to fill in the date that you upload your report to the GMS system and submit to OVW. Questions two through four will pre-populate for you. So it will have the accurate reporting period checked as well as the year. While this is pre-populated, it's good to always give this a scan just to make sure it is accurate. Question five asks for the type of grantee organization. Here you're going to check the one answer that best describes the type of agency or organization that is administering your CY program funds. As you see, there's two columns of options, but there is an other category if none of these are the right fit. Question seven looks at point of contact. For this question, we ask that you provide contact information for the person who knows the most about the day-to-day -day activities of your CY program grant. When we look at your data, if we have any questions, this is the person that we're going to contact. Therefore, it's important that they are the one that knows the most about your activities and what you've reported. Question 8A asks, does your grant specifically address underserved populations? Here you're going to check yes or no. If you check yes, you're going to use question 8D to indicate those underserved populations that you're serving. You're going to check all that apply. Question 8C is where you're able to provide additional information about those populations served. Question nine asks if the grant specifically addresses tribal populations. If your grant does, you'll check, check yes, and then you're going to list which tribes or nations. Answers like all tribes in our state are not a valid response. Unfortunately, we are unaware of all of the tribes in your state, so it's best if you detail those for us. If you run out of room, you can continue in the narrative question in the back. The final question of this section asks what percentage of your CY program funds were directed to each of these areas, sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. You decide how to make this determination based on your CY program funded activities, such as types of victims, staff you employ, the types of training content you're presenting, etc. The total has to equal 100%. No matter how you divide it, as long as your total is equaling 100%, then you have accurately filled out this question. Additionally, the percentages may change each reporting period depending on your activities. Just because you've answered it one way in the past does not mean it has to be answered the same in the future. Section A2, staff information. 
If you're using your CY program funds for staff positions during the current reporting period, you're going to check yes and then fill out this section. Here are a few tips for reporting staff. When you consider reporting staff, remember that you're only reporting staff if they're funded by grant funds. This report only captures grant-funded activities across all of its subsections. Staff is the section where we most often see grantees reporting non-grant-funded staff people. We encourage you to think about your staffing before you answer this question, whether they're full-time, part-time, came on partway through a reporting period, are only partially funded by the grant, and have that guide what you report here. Here are a couple other tips that go along with that. So for the purposes of this form, you're going to report by activity performed rather than job title. This means that if you have a program coordinator that is doing both program coordination and training, you'd expect to see SCEs in both the program coordinator and trainer category. Time should be prorated if necessary. So when someone is part-time or hired partway through the grant period or as a contractor, that is when you will prorate their time and only include the time funded by CY program funds. For the purposes of this form, you're going to report to the second decimal, for example, 1.25. And then finally, we ask that you use the other category sparingly. As stated earlier, try to fit your staff person FTEs into one of the existing categories. However, we do understand that sometimes this isn't possible and the other category is applicable. We do ask that you provide additional information in the narrative about what this staff person does. So here is what we call our cheat sheet for calculating FTEs. Calculations are based on 40 hours a week for 26 weeks, which is 1,040 working hours in a six-month reporting period. Therefore, one FTE would be 40 hours a week for those 26 weeks, and therefore, they would be working 1,040 hours out of the possible 1,040 hours. As you see on this tip sheet, We've broken that down for 0.50 staff, 0.40 staff, 0.25 staff, and 0.10 staff. The easiest way to calculate an FTE is to take the hours worked by an employee that were grant funded in a six-month reporting period and dividing by 1040. We're going to go into a few examples so we can test this out together. The first example reads, your organization has on staff one full-time victim advocate whose salary is 50% funded by the grant and another full-time victim advocate whose salary is 45% funded by the grant. In this case, you report only the percent of salary that is grant funded. The correct FTE under victim advocate will be 0.95 FTE. That is that 50% and that 45% added together. So if you look under the Victim Advocate category, you'll see 0 0.95. The second example. Your grant funds a full-time employee who spent 12 hours a week coordinating the program, 18 hours a week training professionals in the field, and 10 hours conducting outreach to victims. In this case, you would divide staff time by function. The correct FTE under program coordinator would be 0 0.30 FTE because of the 12 hours divided by 40 hours, 0.45 FTE under trainer for the 18 hours divided by 40 hours, and 0.25 under outreach worker for the 10 hours divided by 40 hours. Example number three. Three months into the reporting period, your program hired a 100% CY grant-funded administrative assistant who works 40 hours a week. In this case, you would need to prorate the FTE to reflect three months of the six-month reporting period that the administrative assistant was employed. The correct FTE under support staff would be 0 0.50 FTE because of three months divided by six months. So you'll see all of our examples in the GMS form totaling 2.5.
2.45 total FPE. Section D, Purpose Areas. All grantees must complete this section. Here you're going to check all the purpose areas that apply to activities supported with your CFY program funds during their current reporting period. As you see, there are only two purpose areas listed. However, it is very likely there are other purpose areas or interest areas that you are addressing under your grant. Please use question 13 to describe those additional purpose areas or the program interest areas addressed by your grant. You can refer to your grant proposal if you have any questions about what your purpose areas or program interest areas are. If you are looking to change your purpose areas or program interest areas, your program specialist must approve all changes. Section C1, Training. If your CY program funds were used for training activities during the current reporting period, you're going to check yes and then you'll fill out this section. Here's a tip for training. For the purposes of this form, training is defined as activities for professionals or volunteers acting in the role of a professional to improve their response to victim survivors as it relates to their role in the system. Here, you're not going to count staff development of grant-funded staff or community education in this section. Instead, what this section is looking at are those training events that you provided using CY program funds or trainings that you used your CY program funds to send a professional to. Before we get into the training example, I'll just orient you to the section a little bit. So question 14 looks at training events provided. And question 15 looks at number of people trained. There's a long list of professionals that continue on to the next page. You'll see that there are two columns, school-based and non-school-based. When you report the professionals trained, you're going to include them either in the school-based category or the non-school-based category. You won't include the same individual in both. You'll only count them once. So let's go into an example so we can look more at this section. Grant funds supported nine training events for professionals this reporting period. Four training events provided by other funds also took place. 110 school-based professionals and 85 non-school-based professionals attended the grant-funded training events. 65 professionals intended training events provided by other funds. So in this case, you would only report the nine grant-funded trainings in question 14 and those 195 professionals that attended those trainings. If you wanted to talk about other training events that were provided by your organization and how they complemented the grant-funded ones you provided, you could do so in the narrative. However, for the purposes of this form, you're only including the grant-funded training and number of people trained. So looking at the GMS, you'll see the nine reported in question 14. And then scrolling through 15, you'll see the various categories of professionals trained, totaling 110 school-based professionals and 85 non-school-based professionals. Question 16 is where you will check off the training content areas that were covered during those training events. Here you're going to check all that apply. And question 16 continues on to the next page. Question 17 is an optional additional information question. So here is where you could discuss the effectiveness of training activities funded or supported by your CUI program grant, and you can provide any additional information. Sometimes we see grantees provide information about evaluations they have done with their training and then the results of those and how well the training went. Question 18 is where you can provide more information about staff development. 
So if CY program funds were used for training staff, this is where you could put that here. The CCR section provides a picture of the relationships that you have with other agencies and organizations within your community and the frequency with which you interact with these agencies and organizations. This question will include all agencies and organizations, not just your grant partners. If you look at the GMS, you'll see the first column lists all the agencies and organizations. This list continues on to the next page. The next column looks at the frequency with which you provide or receive referrals or coordinate with the agencies or organizations listed in the first column. These activities are most often related to individual victims or survivors, and the frequencies are daily, weekly, and monthly. The next column looks at meetings. Here you're going to report the frequencies which you meet with the agencies and organizations listed in the first column. These meetings are most often associated with system changes. For instance, a task force meeting or maybe a meeting to address changes to specific policies or protocols. The next column, MOU partner, is where you will check off if the agency or organization is an MOU partner of yours. And then finally, the last column is where you would check off if the agency or organization is a required partner of your grant. And here I will just scroll down so you can get a feel for all the various agencies or organizations. Question 20 is another optional additional information question. So here you can discuss the effectiveness of your CCR activities that are funded or supported by your CY program grant and also provide any additional information you would like us or your program specialist to know about your CCR activities beyond the checkboxes. Section C3, Policies. If your CY program funds were used to develop, substantially revise, or implement policies or protocols during the current reporting period, you're going to check yes and fill out this section. If not, you'll move to section C4. If you look at this question, Question 21 looks at the types of policies or protocols that have been developed, revised, or implemented. These are checkboxes, so you will check all that apply. If the policy or protocol is still in the development or revision phase, you should not report the policy or protocol implemented until the period when it is actually finished. This way you'll avoid counting the policy or protocol more than once as you're filling out the various reporting forms that are due during the course of your grant. By substantially revised, we mean that you spent a good amount of time revising the policy or protocol, not that you added another group under your underserved populations policy or you added another group you were working with on a policy. There has to be a substantial revision. Looking at question 22, this is another optional additional information question. Here you could provide more detail about those policies or protocols that you're implementing. Section C4, Products. If you used your CY program funds to develop, substantially revise, or distribute products, you'll check yes and fill out this section. If not, you'll move on to section D. For the purposes of this question, you're going to report the number developed or revised, the title topic, the intended audience, the number of users distributed, and other languages. In this example, you see one under brochures, Likely, when you develop a product, you're only making one version of it. Therefore, we often expect this to say one. The topic is next, and then the intended audience, in this case, school staff, and then the number of views are distributed. So that will be the number you actually hand out, not the number you print in a reporting period. So say you printed 500, but you only handed out 125, you're going to report 125 here. 
And in this example, this particular brochure was also printed in Spanish. It's possible that you're going to develop a product in a reporting period and not distribute it. And it's also possible that you may distribute a product during a reporting period, but you have previously developed it. In that case, it is completely okay to report the number of users distributed and then not have anything in the developed or revised box. And then the reverse, you may have one in the developed box, but zero under the user distributed. Section D is victim services. As previously mentioned, this is where we are going to talk about the special instructions that you will need to use most accurately fill out this section. But before we look at that, let's look at some tips for victim services. Most of the data requested in the victim services section is congressionally mandated, meaning that Congress wants to know how many of the number of youth victim survivors seeking services were served and how many could not be served. You're going to provide information in this section that represents only the youth victims that were served by your CY program funding. As mentioned previously, the term children and child on the form also refers to youth and young adults in this section. And again, you will not be able to accurately fill out the victim service section without using the special instructions. When considering reporting a victim survivor, you want to ask yourself three questions. First, what services did the youth victim or exposed youth request or accept? The victim survivor has to request or accept services before you would count them in this section. Question two, what services are you funded to provide under your CY grant? You're only going to report on the grant funded requested services you provide, not services you provide with other funding. Third, is the youth or exposed youth a primary victim of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, the victim must be a primary victim of one of these victimizations to be served using grant funds. Who is not counted at all? Those seeking only services not funded with your CY program grants. Those who did not accept any of the grant funded services that were offered or recommended. So if a youth looks for services and you offer them and they decline, you would not count them at all on this form. And then finally, those who are not primary victims of or youth exposed to sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, or stalking. Looking at question 24, you'll see that the question is broken down to serve, partially serve, and not serve. On the slide show, you'll see the definitions for those. So served, received all requested services that are provided by CY grant funds. Partially served, received some but not all requested services that are provided by CY grant funds. And not served, received none of the requested services that are provided by CY grant funds. Before we move on and look at examples, I did want to take a moment to note um, the partially served and not served victim survivors. We find that grantees are often worried about reporting victims as partially served or not served because they fear that it will appear that they are not meeting their goals and objectives or will shed a negative light on their program. However, by reporting victims partially served or not served, grantees are helping OVW and decision policymakers understand the scope and burden of violence that stretches far beyond what VAWA is able to fund. OVW knows that VAWA funding is not enough to support every victim who requests services from grantees. Therefore, we want to encourage you to carefully track and report using both quantitative data and narrative data to highlight instances of partial or non-service. Narrative data can highlight long waiting lists for service or full emergency shelters. Your more detailed data can help show the greater need for service that exists. So again, if you find yourself reporting and partially served or not served, that is okay, so long as you're following these guidelines that we're looking at today. So 
So we have mentioned needing to report the primary victimization of a victim survivor. If a victim has experienced more than one type of victimization, you still do need to report them under one primary victimization. For example, a youth's former boyfriend who had a history of very controlling behavior came to her home and sexually assaulted her. She came to your agency looking for help with a protection order. You could report the victim under either domestic violence or sexual assault, but you must choose only one. The sexual assault category may be more appropriate because it was a sexual assault that prompted her to seek services. We ask that you only report the victim once because that keeps you from having a duplicate count of any of the victims during that reporting period. If you serve a victim in more than one reporting period, you can count them once in each of them. It's just that they must only be included once under their primary victimization. We're going to look at question 24 and 26 together. So here's 24. And then here's 26. What you'll see is that question 24 and 26 are counting different individuals. Question four is looking at youth victims who have been directly subjected to a violent act, whereas question 26 are youth that were indirectly exposed. You'll see in question 26 that there are categories for sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. Going back to question 24, you'll see there's only sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking. This is our first instance where you need to use a special instruction so that you can most accurately report who you're serving. So in question 24, you're going to report youth victims of domestic violence in the dating violence category. So you'll add the dating violence and domestic violence together. And then separately, in the narrative, you're going to provide a breakdown between dating violence and domestic violence. This will be in narrative question 45. And here is that extended template for question 24 that you will report in 45. As you see, it gives you the instructions of how you're going to report the domestic violence victim and how you're going to copy and paste the expanded template into narrative question 45 and then correctly fill in what that data should look like. So for instance, if you had 20 served dating violence victims in question 24, but 10 of those were domestic violence victims, you would paste this template into narrative question 45 and instead have domestic violence served to be 10 and dating violence served to be 10. What we will do is take this template and we will make those data changes in our, our end since the form itself limits you. Let's look at an example. Your program offers crisis intervention under your CY grant. A youth victim of domestic violence asks for this service, and your grant-funded advocate provides this. In this case, the victim receives a requested service funded by your CY grant. They should be reported as served under the dating violence column in question 24. So you'll see in our DMS, there they are, one, under served. Then you would copy and paste the expanded template from the special instructions into question 45 and indicate that this is a victim of domestic violence, not dating violence, by filling in the template with domestic violence served being one and dating violence being zero. Let's look at a couple other examples related to question 24 and then 26. The father of a boy who was sexually assaulted by his stepfather comes to your program seeking art therapy for the boy and parent-child counseling. You're funded by your CY grant to provide these services. You're able to provide only parent-child counseling if there is a waiting list for the art therapy services. The boy is still on the waiting list at the end of the reporting period. In this case, the child victim received only some of the services requested that you are grant funded to provide. This child will be reported as partially served under sexual assault column in question 24 and the reason program unable to provide services due to limited resources priority setting will be checked in 28. So looking at the GMS, you see the sexual assault partially served as one. 
And going to question 28, this is where you need to check the reasons why a child who was directly exposed or a child who was indirectly exposed to violence was served or partially served. So you'll see that checked off here. These are check boxes, so if there is more than one child victim who has the same reason for being partially served or not served, you're still only going to check it that one time. Let's look at question 26 for this next example. The aunt and legal guardian of a child who witnessed domestic violence before being removed from her home contacts your program seeking information about counseling services for the child, which you are funded to provide with your CY grant. You are unable to provide the requested service because all sessions are full. In this case, the child did not receive the service that was requested and that you are grant funded to provide. Therefore, this indirectly exposed child will be reported as not served under the domestic violence column in question 26, and the reason program reach capacity will be checked in question 28. So if you look on the DMS, you'll see that child reported as not served. And then here you'll see question 28 under the children and directly exposed to violence column, the second column, program reach capacity is checked off. Like we did before with questions 24 and 26, we're going to look at questions 25 and 27 together. Again, these questions are looking at separate individuals. Question 25 looks at youth victims who have been directly subjected to a violent act of sexual assault, domestic violence, or stalking, or dating violence. And then question 27 looks at youth indirectly subjected to a violent act of sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, or stalking. So as you see here, there are those four columns for those four victimizations. However, just like before, for the directly exposed youth, question 25 does not have a domestic violence category. Additionally, the relationship to offender category that is looking at the current or former spouse or intimate partner of youth is not included. Therefore, there are a couple things here that the special instructions will guide you to do to work around these missing places where you would report data. So looking at question 25, We'll pull up this template. If you provided services to youth victims of domestic violence, you're going to report all of those domestic violence relationships under the dating violence unknown category. Similarly, there's no space to report the current or former spouse or intimate partner of youth relationships for youth victims of sexual assault or stalking. Therefore, you're also going to report those relationships in the unknown category of their respective victimization. Then, like before, you're going to copy and paste the expanded template into narrative question 45 with the correct victim relationship data filled in. So if you look, this is the first part of the template. We have sexual assault, and then the rest of it, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. And you'll notice the current or former spouse or intimate partner of youth category that is not included in question 25 is included on this template. Something to note about question 25 as well as 27 is that here you're going to report the child victim's relationship to offender related to what you reported previously. So if you reported a child under sexual assault in question 24, we would expect to see their relation to offender in the sexual assault category. However, if a child has experienced more than one type of victimization or is victimized by more than one perpetrator, you can count that child in all the categories that apply. So before, in question 24, where you have to pick that primary victimization, if there was a secondary victimization here, you could include that. Therefore, we expect the total in each of these categories to be 
equal to or greater than the totals in question 24. That also applies for question 27. You'll see here, for if a child that was indirectly exposed to violence experienced more than one type of victimization or had more than one perpetrator, you can include them once in each of the boxes that apply. I'm just going to scroll down and you'll see question 28 again. And then that moves us along to question 29. So whereas the youth victims and youth indirectly exposed to violence were split into questions 24 and 26 and then 25 and 27, here the child victims as well as the children indirectly exposed are captured in question 29. They're just separate columns. So looking at question 29, we're looking at the demographics of child victims and children indirectly exposed to violence that were served or partially served. The first demographic is race or ethnicity. So here, you're going to report the race or ethnicity of the children that were served, the children or youth that were direct victims. And then in the second column, the children or youth that were indirectly exposed. Here, you can count a youth in all the categories that apply. So if a youth self-identifies as both Hispanic or Latino as well as white, you can count them each once in each. Therefore, the total for the race ethnicity section would be equal to or greater than the total number of youth that were served or and partially served. And then, again, the total number of children indirectly exposed that were served and partially served. The next part looks at gender. Here, the total needs to equal the amount of youth victims in the first column and the amount of youth that were indirectly exposed in the second column that you reported as served and partially served. A youth may only be counted once in the gender category that you choose for them. The next part of the demographics question looks at age. You'll notice there are categories 0 to 12, 13 to 17, and unknown. The CY program is funded to serve youth and young adults ages 18 to 24, and there isn't a category here for them. Therefore, this is the third instance where you need to use the special instructions so you can report as accurately as possible. We ask that you report all youth ages 18 to 24 in the 13 through 17 age category in question 29, along with those that were age 13 to 17. And then you're going to provide the breakdown between those two categories using an expanded template in question 45. So much like you did for the previous question. Here is that expanded template. You'll see the option of filling in for all age categories, 0 to 12, 13 to 17, 18 to 24, as well as unknown. If you need to expand on these ages at all, you can include that in the narrative as well. Otherwise, please just break down the age categories as accurately as possible. The final part of question 29 looks at additional demographics of child victims and youth that were indirectly exposed. These are demographics that you would find out incidentally. It's not something you would ever have on an intake form or you would ask the youth directly. Therefore, oftentimes the numbers we see reported in this part of question 29 are much lower, and that's okay. We'd never want you to feel as though you have to ask this information because that would provide a barrier to service. Again, instead, these are things you find out incidentally, not because you've asked 
it on a form. Question 30 looks at the services that were provided to child and youth victims as well as children and youth that were indirectly exposed. Much like question 29, they are split by column. The first looking at youth victims and the second looking at youth indirectly exposed to violence. Here you're going to count each youth once in each category of service that they received, even if they received the service multiple times during the reporting period. So if you had one youth who received six counseling sessions, you're still only going to count them once in the counseling services category. Here's that list continued. And then question 31 is where you could further detail any of those services provided to the youth. Question 32 looks at the number of non-abusing parents and caregivers that received support or referral. So this is an unduplicated account. Non-abusing parents and caregivers can be counted once in each category that applies. Only non-abusing parents or caregivers whose children received CY-funded services should be reported here. In that first box, on question 32, that's looking at those that receive support, and that second box are those that receive referrals. Question 33 looks at the support and or referrals provided to non-abusing parents or caregivers. The first column is looking at support, the second referrals. And here you're going to report each parent or caregiver that receives that type of support. You'll count them once. They may have received the support from you and also additional referral. Therefore, you could count them once in each box under each category, but only once. Question 34 is where you could provide more information if you provide home-based services to a child or caregiver. Question 35 is where you could detail other services that youth victims or indirectly exposed youth or parents and caregivers received, but were not services supported with your CY funds, so from another source. Here you could describe in detail those. Question 36, you can enter not applicable. This question does not apply to CY grantees. Question 37 looks at shelter services. If you used your CUI program funds for emergency shelter, here you would report the total of non-abusing parents or caregivers, the number of accompanying family members, as well as the number of bed nights. Question 38 looks at protection orders. Those, those would be protection orders, either temporary or final, that were requested or granted. And those would be the ones that CY program funded staff provided assistance to non-abusing parents or caregivers and youth during the current reporting period. You'll see there sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. And you have the ability to report who those temporary and final orders are for, whether it's the parent or caregiver, the children or youth, or both. And then finally, the last question of the section, question 39. Here you can further discuss the effectiveness of services provided to youth as well as to parents or any other information that you believe is important to best understanding the work of your program. Section 
section E, narrative. So here is the final section. There is one last instance where you will need to use the special instructions. I will go over that if we get to that question. But first, let's look at questions 40 and 41. Both questions 40 and 41 must be answered every time you report. So for each reporting period, the January to June, as well as the July to December. Question 40 looks at the grant goals and objectives of your CY program. And so here you're going to report on the status of your goals and objectives as of the end of the current reporting period. You should refer to your original grant proposal if you're not sure of your grant program's goals and objectives. Here, this question is where your OVW program specialist will pay close attention. This question enables them to monitor the status of your goals and objectives. Here, you're going to indicate whether the activities related to your objectives for the reporting period have been completed, are in progress, are delayed, or have been revised. You should include any additional information that you think your OVW program specialist needs to know in order to best understand what you have or have not accomplished. You can comment on your successes and challenges. If you have not completed an objective that should have been completed during that reporting period, that's something you must also provide an explanation for. Question 41 looks at what services or resources did you provide to ensure linguistically, culturally, and community relevant services for underserved communities. So here you're going to detail that. Question 42 and 43, grantees must answer these questions annually, so on the January to June reporting form only. However, you are encouraged to report on these questions every period. When we take grantee data and use it in our report, we also include quotes from grantee narrative, and these two are questions that we often pull many of our quotes from. So we like to read them, and we like to really learn about your programs by reading them and the needs of your communities. So yes, they may only be required once, but we do encourage you to fill these out every time. Question 42 is looking at the most significant areas of remaining need in regard to improving services to children and youth exposed to violence as well as children and youth, youth indirectly exposed. This does not need to be just about what your grant funded to do. Instead, this is broader. This is looking at your community and the youth and families in your community and what are the needs that you and other service providers are not able to reach at this time. Question 43, what has CY funding allowed you to do that you could not do prior to receiving this funding? Question, please be as specific as possible. If you have any information about what it was like in your community before receiving CY funds that you can compare with results to what it's like now that you have CY funding, that's something we would really like to know about and it's something we would definitely highlight in one of our reports. We can use your stories and statistics that you provide to really make these reports come to life. Question 44, as promised, the last time on the form that you're going to need to use the special instructions to most. So for question 44, you're not going to answer the question that's stated on the form. Instead, you're going to use the special instruction, and they read. If you use CY funds for prevention and education activities, do not answer the narrative question that appears on the form. Instead, please copy and paste the expanded template below into narrative question 44 with accurate data filled in. Additionally, please describe all multifaceted prevention activities and events that you engaged in during the current reporting period. Please include activities such as community organizing or awareness, prevention strategies employed within school settings, media, and other outreach efforts, public education events, and engaging men as mentors and role models. So looking at question 44 and the template on this slide, you'll see the first thing you're going to fill in is total number of prevention and education events provided. 
those are those that you're grant funded to provide. The next is total number of people educated. So if you look, we have the categories community members, parents, K through 12 students, college students, educators, administrators, and number of all other participants. Therefore, if you reported 500 total people as educated, if you spread those out between those first categories and then the other types of individuals that were educated were not students or parents or educators, then all of those not in one of those designated categories would be considered all other participants. Therefore, the total of all of those categories we expect to be equal to the total number of people educated that you're reporting in row number two. Question 45 is the last question on the form. And that is the narrative question that we were referencing earlier. That is where you're pasting in all of your additional information that you'd like us to know about the data submitted. So let me move us to that question. So first you'll see here, here's question 44. Here's an example of what we just chatted about for the question 44 template. You'll see that total number of people educated at 2,125. And if you add up all of those education categories, that will equal 2,125 who attended those 55 education events. Underneath that, you'll see the start of the narrative detailing some of those education events. Question 45. Here are all those expanded templates we talked about. So here you see question 24, the domestic violence and dating violence breakdown. Question 25, the expanded template for the relationship to offender categories. So you see sexual assault followed by domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking. And then finally at the bottom there, question 29, the extended template for age. And you'll see it includes the 18 to 24 category. And the age has been split between the 13 to 17 and 18 to 24 categories for both child and youth victims and children and youth indirectly exposed. The special instructions are very important, and they can be tricky. So if you have any questions or you don't understand those templates, please give us a call, and we'd be happy to chat with you about them and make sure your understanding is firm and you're able to move forward with reporting your data. Once your data is all filled into your report, you are going to need to validate your form before you upload it back into the GMS system. So you're going to hit the Validate button, and there are three possible windows that are going to appear. The first warning is this red X in a circle. This means that the form has found that there's a potential error that it's going to want you to look at. If you click Yes, it will bring you back to that error, and you'll have the opportunity to review it and fix it. If you do not look at it, that's okay, but your form's not going to validate. So really, if you see this error, there is something you need to change in order to make the form happy and move forward with the validation process. The second warning is what we call a soft warning. That is in the yellow triangle with the exclamation point. And this type of warning is one where the form thinks Something may be misaligned or may not be accurate. If you click yes, you can go look at that. If it is indeed accurate, you're not going to need to change it in any way. Instead, you're going to be able to continue forward with the validation process. So if you see this error, we encourage you to check out what is setting it off, but you do not necessarily need to change anything in order to validate. Finally, the last warning is not actually a warning. Instead, is that it's indicating your form has been successfully validated and is ready for submission. So when you see this window, it means you're good to go and you can validate the form and put it into the GMS system. One validation error that CY grantees report is if they do not serve youth 
that were indirectly exposed and therefore do not have data in the categories and questions related to those youth. The form sometimes will give an error saying that there must be data entered. Therefore, if you are a program not serving youth indirectly exposed and that happens to you, fill in those questions with a one and then indicate in narrative question 45 that you have to put in this dummy data just to get your form to validate. Then we will be able to see that note from you and remove that dummy data and then make your report accurate. Unfortunately, this is a validation error that sometimes happens and we cannot control it and therefore we've kind of come up with this workaround to work with that. And that type of thing, any issues where you may need to put in dummy data just to validate the form, the instructions are the same. Do what you need to do to get the form through and then detail those issues in narrative question 45 so that we can see what's going on and then make your report as accurate as possible by following any instructions you've left for us. Here is our website. So here you can find sample progress reporting forms and instructions as well as our special instructions. Any training dates and materials, um, all of the reports to Congress or summary data reports we have as well as any OVW updates on reporting. And then finally, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us on our general line or email. Just let us know you're a CY grantee, and you'll be connected with the CY program uh, staff person who works here. And then here is how you can reach your program specialist at OVW. Here's that phone line. And then finally, if you need any assistance with your GMS account, we're having issues with the form within your GMS account, here is who you would call or email with those questions. Thank you so much for joining us today. Again, if you have any questions about the reporting form or the special instructions or anything like that, give us a call, send us an email. Always happy to help. Thank you.